Along with the other historic dates of notable accomplishments on Mount Everest, such as the known ascent by Hillary and Tenzing in 1953, the first oxygenless ascent by Habler and Mesner in 78, there was, of course, the May 1st, 1999 discovery of George Mallory at nearly 27,000 feet on the North Face. He was discovered 75 years after disappearing with his climbing partner, Andrew Irvin, last having been seen above 28,000 feet on the Northeast Ridge. Only six people have ever been at the site of the remains of George Lee Mallory, and today I speak with my friend Andy Politz about his experiences on May 1st, 1999, when the body was first discovered. It's an insightful and enlightening look at Andy's experience up there, wherein he told me some things that I don't think anybody has ever heard before. It's very interesting. Stay tuned. At the end of this video, I'm going to share with you a new playlist that is specifically for the mystery of Mallory and Irvin, for those sleuths who are looking for more and want to be able to resource more and find them quickly at your fingertips, this one's for you. Now to my conversation with Andy Politz from his home in Washington State. So Andy, your first Everest expedition was 85, I believe. Yeah. And then um, you summited in 1991 on the north side and so from there fast forward 1999 the morning of may 1st the incredible day of the discovery of george mallory by at least initially by conrad but on the work of the whole team um i'd love you to just walk me through how incredibly overwhelming that experience must have been it must have blown your mind on that day to actually find what we were looking for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I thought the best when when I heard that was the goal of the trip. I I expected that we'd be standing on the North Ridge waving our arms up here is where it would have been, and they would have gone, you know, doing that sort of arm waving and little did I know within probably two to three hours of starting our search we'd find somebody purely because well we thought at the time nobody had ever looked and standing there and George Mallory has exactly the same split in his thumb in the same location that I do and this guy is a legend that I didn't even know that much about. I read a little bit before the trip, read much more after the trip. But this clearly from a mountaineering standpoint, this guy had stopped his fall. And on my walk down from where I was searching down to when Conrad called us in because he had found something, I'd walk by a couple guys that had, one guy that had fallen uh, on my descent my, I told myself I was going to look every one of those guys in the eyes because that could be me so easily. You know, those guys were competent climbers as well. Their last thoughts were Stephen King abject terror. Uh, George Mallory was busy stopping his fall. The ice axe you normally lean on first to stop your fall isn't in his hands whether you gave it away or lost it uh the rope broke the second layer of defense and so he was after that he was clawing with his fingers and one good foot one broken leg splinted by his good leg that was digging in the ice and he stopped his fall because it was steep ground above a little bit of a flat and steep ground below and he was slowing down just enough that he could take advantage of that little flat ground and stopped. And then I can just make up in my mind what I think must have gone through his head. When you and I were there, there was sort of a different perspective and I could step back just a little bit. We were all so overwhelmed to try and do this a little bit right. So, you know, we fell back on our deep knowledge of forensics. <laughs> then we uh, 
thought back to uh, whatever TV shows we may have seen or movies. And first, we got to take pictures. Not before we touch anything, document the scene. And then as little as possible, you know, what's in his pockets and go from there. And then we dug into that hard ground to get, he had a strap under his shoulder that disappeared underneath him. And so there was a pouch of some kind in there, but nobody could get at it because it's frozen and dug for hours, something like five hours, as if you had a one pound ice axe, an ultralight ice axe, and you're digging through your asphalt driveway with it. I mean, it was that kind of density of rock and ice. Mm. And then finally got to the pouch and, you know, thinking maybe there was a camera in there somewhere. And the, you know, the goal would be to find a picture of them standing on the summit, ice axe held high that they had done, mm. whether or not they had or not, and what we believed had happened. So when you see any body on a mountain, it, as you explained, you, your point was that you're not going to just walk by. You're going to look at that person, look them in the eyes. And, and in that moment, respect, uh, pay homage to them. Um, and not even if they're anonymous, you don't know who they are. I suppose we could do research and find out right. who, who these individuals were. But George Mallory, well, when you first came upon the body, I believe most of you believed it was Andrew Irvin first. And then Jake pulled back the, the collar. This says G. Lee Mallory. And then you we hear in the film, Dave Hahn. Oh my God, oh my God. I have goosebumps and I wasn't there. I, I feel it because I remember going two weeks later, but that must have been a pivotal event in life I, there there are only a few things in life that go up there that must have been on that shelf yeah yeah sure. yeah the first name tag we thought what's this can't be mallory we still couldn't believe it was mallory hmm. we thought irvine was wearing mallory's jacket or whatever it was the first item was but the second name tag we realized we were here with george mal we were here with a legend we i mean this was right up there with all the legends we've ever known about from king arthur on down mm. and and we got it settled in fairly deeply heavily just why this guy was a legend he, one he stopped his fall two we're looking at the clothing this guy's wearing i mean He's dressed to go out on the town in the winter, one winter's night, not spending the night going climbing through the night on Mount Everest in 1924. Even nowadays, it'd be so much easier than it would have been back then. There's just they didn't know the mountain, they didn't know the route, they didn't know the weather pattern, they didn't know how humans would react to those altitudes. They didn't know if their oxygen would make it. How long? There's no way that oxygen would have made it. Their quantity of oxygen they were carrying and the rate they were breathing. You know, George Mallory didn't have a mask. He had a tube that he bit between his teeth when he needed some air. He'd, breathe, he'd open up the, the hose more. And they may have had some kind of a mask, but that's not what he had, so it must not have. In 88, I was on the East Face, and I had heard Sue Giller had, in a pre, in 81, 81 or 83, 81, she had found an old British backpack, oxygen set, and uh -huh. it had gotten lost. And so I, I, I had that in the back of my head, and there I'm looking at George Mallory, no, no oxygen rig on, no pack. And uh, hmm. just the whole, so 
did they huck it off the east side? Did they just set it there and it a cornice collapsed some years? It mm. ended up down in the east phase. Mm. Just being kind of an industrial guy and a, uh, I was admiring the clothing he had on and around the prominent points of his body, especially his shoulder blade, it had eroded away around that high point. And the very edge, I remember going up like this to the clothing and the edge is charred, charred. It's like burnt and crumbling it and seeing it just dissolve and wondering, okay, this is probably some kind of wool, knowing that you know, in the industrial world, an arc flash of 10,000 volts, if you're wearing synthetic clothes, it's gonna melt all over you. But so you'll oftentimes wear wool or some other fabric that won't melt in that intense heat for that moment. And there's wool that's charred. And I'm thinking sandblasting, ice blasting, 400 mile an hour abrasive grit going over something will burn steel. If you just hold a sandblaster on steel for too long, it'll start to de deform, not deform it, but heat it up and change the temperature of that steel. And you'll see it in the color of the steel. And here I'm looking at woolen clothing. It's charred. There was never fire up here. It has to be some kind of sandblasting where it's actually charred the wool. Okay, what's the temperature? 30 below zero. Okay, what's the abrasive component? It's ice. I, I still can't comprehend how ice and wind can get that warm to burn wool clothing. Huh. To this day, it's, I have no idea. I've, I've asked a physicist and, you know, in a casual conversation, cocktail party kind of scene. And uh, I've not heard any, how that could be. Wow. How about that, Mr. Wizard? <laughs> well, I'm going to have to go back to my photographs and zoom That's in. That's quite a mystery to me. Andy, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. In an upcoming episode, I'll have Andy's conversation about May 16th, 1999, when the two of us went to the site of George Lee Mallory's remains. I hope that you'll take some time to comment and click like on this video. I love to read what your thoughts are. Also, if you're listening in the podcast episode of this, please be sure to email me with any questions you might have at tom.dharma.pollard at gmail.com. Over in this box here on this side of the video is a new playlist I've created just for stories about the mystery of Mallory and Irvin. And while you're at it, check this box out here. This is the subscribe button. Have a great day. I appreciate you.